only mode. When you hear the tone, meeting is now being recorded. So welcome again, everyone. My name is Paige Valderrama-Graff, and I'm here with Dr. Paul Abel uh, at the NASA Johnson Space Center in Houston, Texas. As we begin today, you're in for some exciting news on a mission that we're involved with, at least Dr. Paul Abel is. And so as we get started, I'm going to turn things over to Paul so he can introduce himself and then get started. Thanks, Paige. Well, good morning, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Paul. I'm uh, the lead scientist uh, for planetary small bodies here at NASA Johnson Space Center. Basically, my area of specialty is asteroids. I, uh, I use big telescopes and spacecraft to study my asteroids. Asteroids are basically big rocks in space, so think of me as a, a geologist. Instead of using a rock hammer and hand lens, I use spacecraft and telescopes to look at my rocks just because they're very far away and they're moving very fast. Okay, So we're going to get into the presentation and I want to little, talk a little bit about what comets and asteroids are. These are fragments, they're the leftover uh, building blocks from the formation of the early solar system. They're very old materials, but they're the leftover bits that didn't get incorporated, didn't get put into the sun, or didn't make up the planets, and they're the leftover bits. On the left-hand side here, you see comets, and they have these nice tails. They have ices on their surfaces or within their surfaces, and when those ices warm up, they produce these nice big tails that you see as comets. Asteroids, on the other hand, on the right-hand side here, these are all images from spacecraft obtained of asteroids, and they're essentially rocky-type objects. They don't have the ices that make the comets so different. So they're rocky objects here, asteroids. Comets have ices and they make those tails. It's a very, very basic uh, definition, but it's just something to, to give you an idea what the difference is between comets and asteroids. Okay, so the first question, I just want to start off and see where you guys are in terms of what you think, uh, what we know. So where do, where do you asteroids and comets come from? I'd like you to just put your answers in the chat, chat window, and, and where do you think the comets and asteroids come from? So we'll give you a few minutes to think about that, and then we'll start seeing your answers momentarily. So right away we're getting from the Rice School and Dove Elementary and the Gray class that fragments from the formation of the solar system or even pieces of planets that broke off. Lynn Haven and Miss Ackerland's group is saying that they're, they're coming from space and they are in space. Evergreen is mentioning that it, they come from destroyed planets, moons, and solar systems. Asteroids come from the asteroid belt, Miss Ackerland's group. Uh, has also included Dove Elementary and Miss Henry, possibly from planets that exploded. Elsick High School is also mentioning the asteroid belt, as does Murfreesboro Middle School. Uh, and let's see if there are other, we have quite a few of you uh, out there. Elsick High School has just added in recently also the Kuiper belt. So broken up planets, broken up moons, Leftover bits from the solar system, asteroid belt, Kuiper belt. A lot of interesting answers there. A lot of interesting answers. So let's, let's go. There were some really good answers here. So let's go to this slide. So this is where comets and asteroids come from. Here's a slide of the, of the solar system. Okay, I've got the sun on the left-hand side here, Earth, Mars, the asteroid belt, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, Neptune, the Kuiper belt, and the Oort cloud. So where comets come from, let's talk about comets first. Comets come from two source regions. The Oort cloud, which is a cloud of icy objects way, way far out, way past the orbit of Pluto, out to 50,000 AU away. One AU stands for one astronomical unit. That's the distance from the Earth to the Sun. It's 150 million kilometers. So this is an Oort cloud. Some of the comets, you can see this big, thick line, some of those Oort cloud comets come in and come towards the Earth. Okay? We also have a second source region of comets in here. You can see my pointer. This is the Kuiper Belt. The Kuiper Belt is located between 30 and 100 AU 
away. Again, icy objects, and again, they can come in and come towards the inner part of the solar system and make very close approaches to Earth. These two object uh, source regions, the Oort cloud and the Kuiper belt, they are the ones that bring us the comets. However, the asteroids, they come from the asteroid belt, which is primarily located between 2 and 3 AU away. Okay? So this is the region of most of the asteroids and near-Earth objects that we see, they come from the asteroid belt. Uh, 95%, 90 to 95% of the objects that we see, the near-Earth asteroids, come from the asteroid belt. The rest, the Kuiper belt and the Oort cloud, they produce about 5 to 10% of the comets that come very close to Earth. Okay, so very good answers, guys. Really, really good answers. Okay, so occasionally I've said that um, we have some asteroids that come very close to Earth. We, this is a near-Earth asteroid. This is 2005 YU-55. It's 360 meters across. It is a uh, radar image here that I'm showing you on the left-hand side. It's round. The radar image is taken by a radar uh, telescope, a 70-meter diameter uh, dish, and it sends a signal out to the asteroid, and the signal bounces off. It's very similar to a, a policeman's radar gun for catching speeding cars. Same type of principle, but the best part about this is we get a picture, an image of the asteroid, and we know its precise orbit and the direction of travel. On the right-hand side here, I've shown you the Earth, the Moon's orbit, and here's the path, the orbital path of 2005 YU-55. And you'll notice that it comes inside um, the Earth-Moon distance. So sometimes these asteroids come very, very close uh, to Earth and it actually pass between the Earth and the Moon. We also have some asteroids that actually come in and actually hit the planet. Um, we have this event. This happened on April, uh, sorry, February 15, 2013, at 9:20 in the morning. This was over Chelyabinsk, Russia. This was a small asteroid, 20 meters in diameter, that came in and exploded in our upper atmosphere. It was a very big meteor, a big bang. No one was killed, but a few people were hurt. But again, it's just to show you that we have some asteroids that come very close to Earth and sometimes even hit the Earth. So here is uh, another event. This is, I'm going to show you a video here in a bit. We'll get this pulled up here. And this is 2014 RC. And what you'll see here, you should see this asteroid move. You'll see a field of stars in the background. And you'll see an object that's moving from the upper left down towards the lower right. That's an asteroid. And asteroids just reflect the light off uh, from the sun. It's very similar to the moon. They don't give off their own light. It's sunlight that hits the surface and reflected back to us. And it's the speed, that motion, that's taken over several minutes of images from the telescope that tells you that it's one, an asteroid. And the speed of the motion tells you that it's a near-Earth asteroid. We can go back to the slides. Okay, so basically this object was discovered on August 31st by our ground-based telescopes. Uh, it was 22 meters uh, in diameter based on the radar uh, observations that we got. So it was a little bigger than the Chelyabinsk impactor, but it's spinning very fast. It's the fastest spinning asteroid that we've seen. It spins, spins once every 16 seconds, really, really quick. And the closest approach, you'll see here on the, on the slide that I have on the right-hand side, was even closer than 2005 YU-55. This came within 0.1 lunar distance, or about 40,000 kilometers away from Earth. Here's the blue line of the asteroid's trajectory, and you can see Earth, and here's the geostationary satellite ring. This is where all our weather satellites are and some of our communication satellites are, and it passed very, very close to Earth. And you can actually see, if you look very carefully, you can see that blue line, the trajectory, the orbital path, of the asteroid actually changes a little bit. It bends up, and that's because it had a close encounter with Earth, and Earth's gravity actually changed its orbit. So that's why even with all these asteroids coming by the, close to the Earth, we have to keep track of them, because it's not just Earth's gravity that affects them. It's also the Sun's gravity. Maybe Venus, maybe Mercury, maybe Mars. If they make close approaches to those planets, then their orbits change a little bit. And we want to know where these asteroids are going after they make a close approach to something like Earth or Mars. Okay, so there's four different types of near-Earth asteroids. I'm going to concentrate on asteroids for the rest of the talk. Four different types of near-Earth asteroids. Amores, Apollos, 
Aitans and Atiras. <coughs> Excuse me. And over here on the right hand side of the slide, I've seen, shown you um, looking down on the solar system. The yellow dot is the sun, the thick line is Earth's orbit, and the thin line represents the asteroid's orbit. And what you notice about the Amores and the Atiras is those orbits, those asteroid orbits, do not cross Earth's orbits. The Apollos and the Aetons, though, their orbits do cross Earth's orbit. Okay, so they're Earth-crossing asteroids. So these guys are very interesting from the standpoint of things that come very close to the Earth and things that actually may hit the Earth. So just keep those two types of asteroids in mind as I go through the rest of the talk. So let's talk a little bit now about the discovery rate of asteroids. What did we know about asteroids and when did we know about them? So again, we're looking down on the solar system. The sun is in the center. You've got Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars orbits shown on the, the chart here. And Jupiter's orbit is off the screen. We can't see Jupiter. It's too far away on this scale. So in 1800, 1800, we didn't know anything about asteroids. There were no asteroids known and discovered. And I'm going to step through here over time, and you're going to see green, yellow, and red dots appear. Those represent the asteroids as we find them. So in 1850, we had 10 asteroids known and named, and you can see some green dots here. 1900, we've now got hundreds of known objects in the main belt and some even inside the orbit of Mars. So we're starting to see some asteroids appear here and then one inside the orbit of Mars. Let's go again. 50 years later, now 1950, almost 2,000 known objects with a handful of Earth-crossing uh, asteroids. These are these red dots you see. And 1990, we've now got over 9,000 objects. 2000, now we have automated search telescopes, and that brings total to over 86,000 objects. 2007, August, now we have nearly 380,000 objects, ranging from a few meters up to the dwarf planet Ceres. Ceres is as big as Texas. It's uh, about 1,000 kilometers across. It's also the target of the Dawn mission. So if you guys Google Dawn spacecraft, you'll see some of the neat images it's getting of Ceres, because it's at Ceres right now. So as of a few days ago, from the Minot Planet Center, we are tracking over 681,000 objects. Of that number, over 12,660 near-Earth objects. And of the Aetons and Apollos, remember, these are these Earth-crossing asteroids. We have 923 Aetons, 6,816 Apollos. Over 1,585 of those are considered potentially hazardous. These are asteroids that, that may be dangerous to the Earth. I should tell you right now that the Earth is very safe. We don't see any asteroids coming at us, but these are the guys that we are watching. These are the type of asteroids that we are watching. Out of the total population, we think there's more asteroids out there. So we think there's 20,000 or more near-Earth objects that have diameters of 140 meters and up. 300,000 near-Earth objects with diameters of 50 meters and up, and millions of near-Earth objects with diameters of 15 meters and up. So basically, there's a couple of things I want you to take away from this slide. One is, note that the dots are much, much bigger than the scale here, right? I've made the dots bigger than the actual scale, because if I made them to the proper scale, you wouldn't see the dots. So we actually have been able to send spacecraft from Earth out past uh, the asteroid belt to Jupiter. It's not like there's a wall of material in here. But the other thing I want you to notice is that we live in a very busy place. There's lots and lots of asteroids near the Earth, and that presents both an opportunity and a hazard. The hazard part is we have to watch out for these asteroids and make sure they don't hit the Earth, similar to what happened in Chelyabinsk, or even worse, what happened to the dinosaurs 65 million years ago when a very big asteroid hit and killed off the dinosaurs. But also we have lots of asteroids here that we can visit with spacecraft both robotic spacecraft and maybe even human missions to these asteroids. So those are the things I'd like you to keep in mind as you look at this slide. This is another way of showing um, that slide, but just in a little different way. So here's the year here in terms of discovery. Here is the number of asteroids here discovered. And here you can see this blue curve. This blue curve keeps going up. And what you notice is that at the start of 1998, we were actually given lots, lots of money 
and we're told that we need to start looking for near-Earth asteroids. And this is why, all of a sudden, the curve came up. So we had advancements in uh, technology. We had also had advancements in budget to help us find these near-Earth asteroids. So we got smarter about finding the asteroids. We got smarter in terms of how to look and the types of equipment, both telescopes and computers, that we use to find these asteroids. Okay, so I have another question here for you guys. What kind of asteroids are the best ones for a spacecraft to visit and why? So here again, I put down the four types. Tell me which ones you think are the best to visit and why. I'll give you a minute to think about that and then put your answers to the chat window. And that Y portion is really important. So you can see those orbits of those asteroids in comparison to the orbit of Earth. So think about which would, do you think is the best to visit and why, and we'll see what we get. So we're getting some answers come in. The Rice School has said the Apollos because they're the closest to Earth. Dove Elementary agrees with the Apollos. Lynn Haven is mentioning the Amores because it's, and I think they're going to continue that statement. We have Aitons and, and Apollos from Dove Elementary in Ms. Preston's class. Uh, Gates Intermediate says, I assume the two Earth crossing because they come the closest to us. Uh, Toby Farms says Aitons because they might be similar to Earth. Evergreen also believes the Apollos because they come closer to Earth, so many are noticing that orbital path. Easton Elementary agrees with Apollos. Lynn Haven and Miss Mahoney's class says Amores because they are not crossing an Earth's orbit. Lincoln Avenue says uh, Amores as well. Apollos, Atiras from Dove Elementary. So it seems like we're getting, oh boy, a whole lot of information. Oh, one Dove Elementary group is saying, uh, let's see, I already lost that with all of our great input coming in. Uh, the Amores and the uh, Aiton seem to be uh, some of the most popular answers. And one other group says Ms. Ackerlin's, or maybe the first one, the Amores, because they are within the orbit of Mars where they are traveling, but the orbits don't cross. So they are noticing uh, these paths and where they're going. So is there really a, a right answer here, Paul? Yeah, there's actually a, a couple of right answers. So some really good, um, really good feedback, um, boys and girls, really, really good stuff. So the, actually the best ones for a spacecraft to visit are actually the Apollos and the Aitons, and the reason is because they're the ones that come closest to Earth's orbit. And the most ideal um, asteroid is one that has a very, very uh, Earth-like orbit that actually comes close to Earth and maybe even crosses the Earth's orbit. So the Apollos and the Aitons, because they're Earth-crossing, they're the ones that you uh, will send spacecraft to because they're the easiest to get to in terms of the energy, in terms of time, and also in terms of distance. So. Hats off to everybody who said Apollos and Aitons. Very, very good answers. Okay, so let's still look at some pictures now of what the uh, near-Earth asteroids, NEAs, NEA stands for near-Earth asteroid, what do they look like? And I've got them compared here to the Martian moons. So on the right-hand side, we've got um, Martian moons. These are actually asteroids that have been captured. There's Phobos and Deimos. Phobos is about 26 kilometers, Deimos about 15 kilometers. Compare that to the biggest near-Earth asteroid. This is 433 Eros, which is 34 kilometers. This was an image taken by the NEAR uh, spacecraft. This was an American NASA spacecraft that went to visit this asteroid in 2000. And then compare that to scale to the asteroid Itokawa, which is uh, 500 meters, a little more than 500 meters, five football fields long, and we show that to scale. This was the target of the first Hayabusa mission. So let's zoom in on Itakawa now, keeping everything to scale. So here's asteroid Itakawa. You see him 540 meters. The International Space Station, which is about 100 meters in length. And the multi-purpose crewed vehicle, uh, Orion, the new Orion vehicle that we're going to be designing and developing to send our astronauts out beyond low Earth orbit, when its solar panels are deployed, it's 17 meters in cross section. If you look at this rock here, this boulder, it's called Yoshinidae. It's a special name of this boulder, and it is 50 meters, 50 meters in length.
So this is a very interesting asteroid. We learned a lot about it. This is from the first Hayabusa mission. And one of the special things about this asteroid is it is a rubble pile asteroid. And what that means is if you notice there's lots of rocks, there's lots of, of rubble around it. The rocks look like they've been thrown together, jumbled up, piled up, and there's no impact craters. So you don't see any impact craters on this surface like you would on the surface of the moon. Or if you remember from the image of Eros, Eros, the bigger asteroid, had some impact craters on it. This one, they don't seem to have impact craters. And one of the reasons is because of the internal structure of the asteroid. The inside of this asteroid is very unique. It's 40% empty. So the rest of this asteroid, 60% is rock, but the inside is 40% empty. It has what we call a porosity of 40%. So we learned a lot, from, of, um, a lot about asteroids, small asteroids like this, by going and sending spacecraft to them, such as the Hayabusa. So I want to ask everyone here, what do you think asteroid Itakawa looks like? If you just look at this, what does it remind you of? And maybe just put some quick answers in the, in the uh, chat window, and we'll, uh, we'll see what you guys say. So we're getting right away. The Rice School says a pickle, Lynn Haven, a jelly bean, a potato, the Rice School, cashew from Elsick, jelly bean from uh, evergreen, potato or jelly bean from Lynn Haven, a pickle, a pickle, banana, and peanut comes from one of the Dove Elementary, sausage, uh, a, uh, a bean, a potato, a sweet potato, a kidney bean, a sea cucumber. That's a really interesting one. And one group actually, Toby Farm, says they can see a baby inside a mother, almost like a sonogram type of picture wow. uh, from that background. So a banana, a kidney, let's see. So And, uh, and uh, even a pepper, probably like maybe a jalapeno pepper, a hot dog, a hairy smile, a cocoon. Uh, so we have some very interesting answers, mostly food. Mostly food. So that's a very, very interesting. So one of the things that was really neat about working with the Japanese, keep in mind this is the Hayabusa mission, the first Hayabusa mission, and uh, I was a NASA scientist assigned to help the Japanese Space Exploration Agency um, with their mission here. We were cooperating with them. And one of the things that is, is really interesting is most of the people in the United States, when they look at this image, they think of food. And most of your answers, apart from just a few, actually said it was f food, right? So um, the Japanese, though, have a very different way of looking at it. And so when we look at it and we say, is it a vegetable, animal, or mineral, you can play this game. And they actually referred to it as the sea cat. And when I was over there working with them, I didn't understand what they meant by sea cat. So one of my friends, my Japanese friends, got a picture of this, printed it out, and then he drew this on the picture, and you'll see he had a little eyes, and there's some whiskers, and there's a nose, and I still didn't understand, and he said, well, it's obvious, this is a sea cat, and I still didn't get what he was meaning, so he went over to the internet, and he pulled up this image, and this is what he meant. In Japanese, the direct translation is sea cat, but what he was referring to is was a sea otter, so when you guys look up Itokawa, asteroid Itokawa, and the first Hayabusa mission, they refer to Itokawa as the otter. So here's the head of the otter, here's the body of the otter. So it's just a nice little way of showing how different cultures, different international partners, Japanese, view asteroids very differently. They see them more as animals, and we tend to see them more as food. It's just a different way of thinking, but it's kind of a nice surprise. Okay, so let's get down to the um, asteroid. This is an image uh, taken by the spacecraft Hayabusa, the first Hayabusa spacecraft, you'll see a shadow of Hayabusa on the surface of the asteroid as it's coming down to take a sample. It's coming down to get a sample and return this sample to Earth. The sample came back to us in 2010. And one of the things you notice is there's a bright spot here, and I put it in a circle. These are these sort of uh, target markers. Think of them as disco balls in space, they're coated with a really highly reflective material, and there's a strobe light, a flashlight, on the asteroid uh, um, encounter spacecraft Hayabusa that is flashing, and it illuminates this target marker, and this helps it navigate, get down to the surface, because the uh, Hayabusa spacecraft is doing this all on its own, because the light delay time, Itakawa is so far away from Earth, 
that a signal, a radio signal sent from Earth going to Hayabusa and back takes 36 minutes. So the spacecraft has to think for itself to get down to the surface, and this target marker helps it do that. Hayabusa is also solar powered. It has solar panels. You can see these two panels right here. So it is, has to have the sun in line of sight. So the sun is directly behind the spacecraft, and this is actually the shadow of the spacecraft on the surface of the asteroid. It's almost like the spacecraft is taking a picture of itself. Anyway, so now we're going to go to the next image here. And this is the rectangle in here. This is where we're going to blow up, and as the uh, blow up this part of the image, and this is where the spacecraft came down, touched down on the surface, and grabbed the sample. And this is what the area looked like. There's that rectangular image now blown up. This is a one meter scale bar in here, one meter scale bar, so you can see the size. This boulder here is about two meters across. And then all of these little pebbles here are a little bit smaller than that, but some of the very fine pebbles are only six to eight millimeters in diameter. It's very similar to pea gravel, sort of like the gravelly pebbles you may find in your uh, sidewalks or streets. So if we look at the best image that we had from the asteroid Eros, remember that was the big asteroid that the near Shoemaker spacecraft went to back in 2000. This is the best image of the surface we got from that. Here is the best image of the surface of Itakawa from Hayabusa, and again, this is a one meter scale bar. And then compare that to the pavement, the sidewalk behind Johnson Space Center, Building 31, where I work. And here's a boot for scale, and you can see it's very similar to pea gravel. So even on asteroid surfaces, this is a rocky material that's very similar to pea gravel, but the major difference is this is under microgravity. There's one gravity here on Earth, but there's a million times less gravity here on the surface of Itakawa. Very, very different type of gravity. Okay, so let's talk about JAXA's robotic missions to asteroids that they're planning, that we are supporting. JAXA is the Japanese Aerospace Exploration Agency, and we are helping them. They did Hayabusa. They did the first Hayabusa, which went to asteroid Itakawa, was from the mission went from 2003 to 2010. This was an S-type asteroid very similar to a type of meteorites called ordinary chondrites. Hayabusa 2 was just launched last year, 2014 in December. It's going to come back to Earth with its samples from asteroid 1999 JU3 in 2020. It's going this, to this type of asteroid. It's called a C-type asteroid, and it's thought to be a combina combinaceous chondrite-type asteroid. And one of the things that's really interesting about this type of asteroid is they may be full of volatiles and organic matter and maybe even lots of water. So keep those in mind, the difference between Itakawa and 1999 JU3, the target of the Hayabusa 2 mission. So here again, some comparison between Itakawa and 1999 JU3. Both asteroids rotate very, very slowly. Remember 2014 RC, that was the fast spinner one, it was 16 seconds. These asteroids spin very slowly, 12 hours and maybe 7.6 hours. The size, they're bigger, they're 540 meters, and 1999 JU3 is 830 meters or so. So almost eight, eight longer than eight football fields put together for 1999 JU3. Um, Itakawa is an S-type asteroid. Uh, 1999 JU3 is a C-type. Notice they're both Apollo NEAs. So again, these are the type of asteroids that are good to send spacecraft to because they come close to Earth and it doesn't take much rocket fuel to get there and they're potentially hazardous. These are asteroids that we are watching um, just in case they may change their orbit and come towards the Earth. So we want to keep an eye, eye on them and also understand what they're like so that in case we have to push them out of the way, we know what we're dealing with. And again, I showed the orbits here. You notice some Japanese characters. Here's Itakawa orbit in green. 99JU3 is in the yellow orbit, and again, Earth's orbit here, and you can see how close they come on certain parts of the orbit, and this is why it make, they make very good spacecraft targets. So I've got a, a, another question for you. What is special or surprising about asteroid Itakawa? And this is a hint I'll give you is, what is the otter like on the inside? If you were listening very carefully, I mentioned this, but why was this asteroid so surprising to this, and what makes it so special? And the hint is the otter. What's the otter like on the inside? So 
So we'll give you a minute to think about that. And actually, some of you didn't even need a minute. And we're getting actual details. Lincoln School has jumped in right away with saying it's 40% empty. Lynn Haven agrees. All the Lynn Haven groups. Elstick High School is mentioning that it's practically hollow. It's like a sponge is what Easton Elementary said by saying it's 40% it's empty. Uh, uh, the one group from Evergreen says, or you can think of it as 60% full, or about half hollow from another Evergreen group. So they, they were really listening with all these groups saying that otter is empty on the inside, 40% empty. So when literally, when you say empty, are you talking about like just space with nothing there? Could be. It could be space with nothing there. But think of, think of like uh, sand. Sand on the beach, it has 30%. Uh, porosity. So basically the grains of sand, they touch each other at corners, but there's some always gaps in between. So Itakawa, one of the things we know about Itakawa is it's 40% empty. We don't know if there's really, really big pieces on the inside with lots of empty space, or is the little bits on the inside more like sand with very small, but many, many small spaces. All we can tell you is that it's 40% empty. And this has actually changed our way of thinking about these small asteroids. Most small asteroids we think now are rubble pile asteroids with this type of porosity. And that's because of their formation of where they came from in the main belt. They got smashed in together and the main belt asteroids smashed some pieces together and they sent those pieces off towards Earth. And those pieces maybe have been very close to one another traveling on very similar trajectories and then because of their own gravitational interaction came back together and that rock pile, remember that jumbled pile that you see on the image of Itakawa here, and just held together with its own self-gravity. So 40% of this is empty space. And that's very important for us to know if we're going to go and visit them with spacecraft, maybe send astronauts to them, or maybe even have to deflect them off course in case one of these is heading our way. Okay, so really good answers. That's excellent, excellent work. So let's go to the launch now. So Hayabusa 2 mission, this is the launch from uh, December that I was at, and you'll see the launch and the countdown. Let me actually, uh, I'm going to see if I can restart this little video, because it, so give us a second. We'll wake this computer up with the video. And you will notice there is going to be a little bit of sound, but if you can't totally hear it or can't understand, that's okay because it's actually in Japanese. All right, so let me go back here now and share this. ゲーム、ゲーム、ゲーム。ゲーム、ゲーム。ゲーム、ゲーム。ゲーム、ゲーム。ゲーム、ゲーム。ゲーム、ゲーム。ゲーム、ゲーム。ゲーム、ゲー
So let's go to the spacecraft, and I'll show you what the Hayabusa 2 spacecraft is. Um, it's about the size of a small freezer or maybe a very big refrigerator. Um, you'll see some solar panels uh, here on the side. Um, these are, again, it's a solar-powered spacecraft, and we use solar panels uh, to power it because it's still very, very close to the sun. We also have high-gain antennas for communication, so we can talk to Hayabusa and it can talk back to us. And then one of the things that's really neat about it is the sampler horn here. Keep in mind Hayabusa 2 is a sample return mission, so the sample is collected here by the sampler horn. You'll see in the video that I'll show you in a bit, the sample horn um, comes up and touches down and collects the sample, and then all those samples are returned in this re-entry capsule here you can see, and that's the part that comes back to Earth and we collect. The rest of the spacecraft will be diverted on maybe to another asteroid. We're not sure yet. We still got a long ways to go until 2020. Here's another, uh, another view of the spacecraft, um, just to show you. Here are the ion engines. This is an ion engine powered. So instead of a big rocket thrust like you saw um, with the, the rocket launch, this has ion engines. We're showing ions out the back. They're very, very lightweight but very efficient. And these ion engines help it get to um, the asteroid. Again, here's the sampler horn. And one of the other things I wanted to show you was the mascot lander. This is a little lander that is going to be deployed from Hayabusa 2 and go down to the surface of the asteroid. And you'll see that uh, in some slides in a little bit. So here's an artist's rendition of what Hayabusa 2 would look like at um, the asteroid 1999 GU3. And then we're going to show you the animation of the actual mission. And we're going to show that. Bear with us here. So here's the Hayabusa 2 spacecraft coming in. And the first thing it does is it looks where it should land. Where's the best place to land on the asteroid? And it's doing some reconnaissance, figuring out where to go. And then once it finds a place to go, it deploys a target marker. Remember, these are the disco balls in space. And you can see it being illuminated by that flash from the spacecraft. And the spacecraft goes down to the surface near that target marker, and that sample horn comes down, touches down to the surface, collects a sample. Once it has that sample, very, very quick, only about a second, and then it comes back up to the surface. Here now, the, another part that's the, the mission that's really neat is you'll see this little um, spacecraft deployed from Hayabusa 2. This is not the mascot lander. This is a small carry-on impactor. And you'll see Hayabusa 2 moving away from the impactor, and Hayabusa 2 is going to hide behind the asteroid because that impactor is going to explode and it's going to send a, a big projectile, big bullet, into the asteroid to make a crater so that the Hayabusa 2 spacecraft can examine the crater. So there's the projectile going into the asteroid, kicking up lots of debris, forming a crater, and Hayabusa 2 then goes and finds the crater, studies the crater a little bit, and then again is going to deploy a target marker to the surface so it can navigate down towards the crater area and then go down and take a sample from the crater because the crater is exposed. The stuff underneath the crater is fresh material. It's not on the surface that has seen all the effects of Earth, uh, sorry, space. And so it's going to be returned back to Earth. And there it goes, takes off. Okay. That's a pretty incredible video, almost like science fiction, it if is, you ask me. It's really cool. It's a really cool mission. Okay, so let's move on here. So again, Hayabusa 2 impactor, it's a very very fast impact at 2 kilometers per second, really, really quick. It creates this crater. And then we go down, the Hayabusa 2 spacecraft goes down to the surface to collect the samples from, the, from that crater. Here's the lander. Here's the mascot lander. Because remember I said that the, these asteroids have really, really low gravity, like maybe a million times less than, than Earth, 10 to the minus 6 g, we call it, microgravity. You can't um, move, can't walk on the asteroid, and you can't rove on the asteroid like with wheels or like tank treads or anything like that. So you have to hop. So this arm here is a hopper system inside the mascot lander. This arm flips really quickly, and the little mascot lander, which is the size of a shoebox with some instruments in it, it actually hops across the surface. And I'll show you here what, what it does. So here's Hayabusa. Hayabusa is over here in this cartoon. 
this little um, blue box, rectangle, is mascot and it deploys to the surface and it analyzes some part of the surface here and you can see it's radioing back to Hayabusa. It's all its information. And then even during the nighttime, it operates. Even in the nighttime, it operates, but it collects data and then radios back in the daytime. Keep in mind, Hayabusa spacecraft is solar powered, so it has to operate during the daytime. But Mascot has batteries, so it can operate during the daytime. But one of the neat things about it is it hops from place to place and collects information. It lasts about 16 hours, so it will hop collecting information on the surface of the asteroid, getting pictures up close and personal, and then relay all that information back to Hayabusa 2. We also have our own mission. NASA has its own mission to an asteroid, near-Earth asteroid. It's also a sample return mission. So we have Hayabusa 2 that we are helping with the Japanese, and the Japanese are helping us with our mission called OSIRIS-REx. The neat thing about these asteroids is they both arrive in the year 2018 at their target asteroids. OSIRIS-REx is going to be launched in 2016. So Hayabusa 2 is going to a C-type asteroid, 1999 JU-3. OSIRIS-REx is going to a B-type asteroid called Bennu. Again, both of, those astro both of those spacecraft get to their asteroids in 2018 and we'll be able to help each other the mission teams will be able to help each other and learn more about these asteroids. So again, it's a great way of showing international cooperation. And the international cooperation is not just limited to the United States and Japan as we operate our spacecraft together, but also Europe is helping and also Australia. Hayabusa 2 is going to land in Australia, so that's why the Australians are, are really um, happy to help and we're happy to have their help. And the mascot lander is made from Europe. So basically countries like Germany and France have a lot of cooperation that are helping us with Hayabusa 2 mission. So one of the things I wanted to ask is, last question here, name one thing that the samples collected by Hayabusa 2 will help scientists learn about this particular asteroid and why is this important? So if you give you a minute to think about that and if you could uh, answer in the chat window, that would be great. And we'll stand by and wait for your answers to come in. So one thing uh, we have from Lynn Haven is uh, they can collect rocks so we can understand where they came from. Lynn Haven was also saying the fresh rock from the crater, uh, it hasn't been exposed to space for too long, so you can learn a lot from that. Easton Elementary is also mentioning it's, it, to see if it's made of similar materials as to what we have on Earth. To discover what elements the asteroid is composed from comes from Elsick High School. Gates is saying maybe to tell about the amount and type of water in it to see if water from asteroids uh, supplied the Earth with water. Our water perhaps came from somewhere. Uh, Rice School is saying to learn about the kinds of materials within the fragments. And actually, interestingly enough, those fragments, or at least some of them, will come here so we can study them. Murfreesboro is saying to collect rocks, to examine the rocks, uh, also, Lynn Haven is also mentioning how it helps, this whole mission helps us even learn a little bit more about where the asteroid is going and what it is made of. And let's see also from Evergreen, the samples will give them an idea of the matter and atoms that they are made of. It can also let you know how many other, or so many other things about the structure of the planet and helping us understand the universe, this comes from its Ackerlands class, how it works, and to see if there's anything on the asteroid that we can replicate and use for human use. Great, fantastic answers and thoughts. What do you think, Paul? Those are absolutely fantastic answers. Uh, yeah, really, really good stuff there from everyone, boys and girls. That's really awesome stuff. Um, yes, so one of the things that we're doing is we're collecting samples. We want to learn about the type of rocks that um, these asteroids are made of or this particular asteroid is made of and the type of minerals and materials whether there's organics there, what type of organics there may be, what, how much water is there, and how, what kind of water it is. And all of that helps us learn about not only the solar system, um, but also how maybe the Earth and Moon system have formed, and particularly how life may have evolved on Earth. Because some of these asteroids are thought to have brought um, 
organic matter and water to Earth. So learning about these asteroids helps us learn about how maybe we even came to be uh, as life forms on this planet. So here again, this is just to reinforce what you guys have already told me, but you know, the science from Hayabusa and Hayabusa 2 is, you know, how did the asteroids form? How did they evolve over time? We remember we were getting a sample from a crater that's a, a lot fresh on Hayabusa 2. What types of materials are found on asteroids? And have these asteroids, or how ha have these asteroids affected or influenced Earth in the past? And again, the whole aspect of maybe delivering organic matter or water to Earth, the impacts that some of these asteroids have had as well on Earth. And again, it all started 4.6 billion years ago, the formation of the solar system, and these are the leftover bits. So these are like time capsules, asteroids are like time capsules for us to go back and learn about the solar system and learn about the early Earth and how it formed. So I'm going to start wrapping up here in a little bit. So just a couple more slides, like why do, we, why do we study asteroids? There's four main reasons why we study asteroids, right? We study asteroids for exploration. These are the stepping stones. These are the things that help us get out beyond the Earth-Moon system and help us explore uh, and get on to Mars and maybe even other places uh, beyond Mars into the solar system. They help allow us to test out our rockets and ro allow us to test our technologies for deep space exploration, particularly with astronauts, and I've shown you here an astronaut uh, mission. We also have for science. I already talked a lot about why that's important, so I won't go over that too much. But again, these asteroids, samples from asteroids, learning about these asteroids, really important for science. And then resources. I think some of the people actually hit on the fact that some of these asteroids are full of good material for resources that humans can use, and that's, that's exactly right. Some of these asteroids are full of precious metal, like platinum and palladium. Some of these asteroids, as I mentioned, 1999 JE3 is thought to be uh, rich in water, and if you can use that metal and if you can use that water in place, that's very valuable for us as we move into the solar system. Water is especially valuable because it's life support. We can, we can drink it. We can break it down into hydrogen and oxygen. Oxygen we breathe, but more importantly, hydrogen and oxygen, that can be used as rocket fuel. So think of these asteroids as supply depots that we can harness their materials and then use them as gas stations and pump and tank up and then go to other places. And then lastly, why these are important is because of planetary defense. Again, knowing about these type of asteroids, you know, one of these days, one of these guys may be uh, on a, a bad trajectory and maybe come close to the Earth and even hit the Earth. So we want to be ready to understand what we have to do to push these asteroids out of the way. So knowing what these asteroids are like, especially their internal structure, that helps us come up with plans for protecting the planet. And with that, I'm going to leave you with this last slide. I'm done. But one of the things about these near-Earth asteroids is they're really, really great for exploration. As I mentioned before, here's a picture of an uh, asteroid with a human mission to it. This is 9 million kilometers away. Here is the Earth-Moon system in the low right-hand corner. It's a, uh, literally, the Earth is a pale blue dot. And what you're seeing here is the first time humans have stepped out of the Earth-Moon system and actually starting to explore the solar system. And this is an image that I think we'll see in our lifetime, certainly within your lifetime, as humans start to explore the solar system and actually head towards Mars and beyond. So thank you very much. Awesome. Well, first of all, thank you so much, Paul, for your time and for sharing this great information. This has been absolutely, I find this whole mission absolutely fascinating, almost like science fiction, except it's actually reality. So I know it is near the top of the hour, but we're going to have Paul stay with us for a number of minutes to be able to answer some questions. And we're also going to share a view of Paul so you guys can see him as he is uh, answering the many questions that you have. So using your chat window, uh, if you want to start answering or asking some questions, please feel free to. And again, if you do have to uh, get off the line, we so appreciate your time from you in the classroom and your teacher's efforts, as well as Paul, our speaker, who is a very, very busy inter individual. Now, as we get to these questions, um, we had some questions that came in early on that I kind of jotted down 
as we look to also see some other questions coming in the chat window. But Paul, early on one of the questions was asking how old are these comets and asteroids? Can you give us some information about that? Yeah, they're very old. Um, comets and asteroids are very, very old. They're, like I said, the leftover building blocks of the solar system. So their age is about 4.6 billion years. They're the ancient materials. They're, like I said, they're the time capsules uh, of the solar system. So studying uh, these objects, comets and asteroids, help us learn what the early pieces of the solar system were like. And so it's very important. They're very, very old objects. And they tell us a lot about the solar system, how it formed, and actually how the Earth-Moon system formed way back when as well. Excellent. And then also during your discussion of Itakawa and, and the porosity and how it's 40% empty and the porosity and all of that, uh, we had a number of groups asking, how, how do you know it's empty? And mm -hmm. is that like pumice? They're trying to really get a grasp of, you know, what does that really mean that yeah. the inside is about? Well, pumice is really, really porous, and it's not like pumice. The way we do it in, um, at Itakawa is we figured out what type of material it was like, and that helped us get the idea of the type of rock density that it should have been. And then with our images of their spacecraft, as we went around um, the asteroid, you get an idea of the shape and size. And so you have a shape, you have a size, you have a volume, and more importantly, once you have a volume, you can figure out um, how much mass it should have been. So the, the radio science experiments, the trajectory, the gravitational attraction between the asteroid and the spacecraft helps us figure out the mass. So now we have mass, we have volume, you can figure out the density from that, and then the density, what we found, is actually under dense for the type of rock material that we found out that Itakawa is in terms of the ordinary chondrite rock material. That should have had a specific density that we had known, a number. But the number we were getting from, if we assumed it was entirely solid, was way too low. So when we start analyzing that, we have the shape, we have the volume, we have the density, compared to the type of rock that's on its surface, we understood that it was actually under dense, and therefore the only way of doing that is having the inside be 40% empty. So Itakawa is 40% porosity. Excellent. Yeah, it's a hard concept a hard to concept. almost grasp. It really is. And I also loved your sand analogy, because if you look at a bunch of sand grains together, there is the space that porosity between those grains. Uh, and with sand being 30% por uh, porosity, that gives you a little idea of, oh, okay, uh, the, uh, you, can, can, you can dismiss that. Uh, then that gives a, at least a little bit of a, a good thought on uh, what 40% porosity is like. Now there was a question from the Rice School, and uh, they're here in Texas, and they are actually a group of um, fourth or fifth graders, I believe. And they are wondering, how does a student become an intern? How does a student become an intern? Wow. Yes, and maybe I can take yeah. a first stab at that, because NASA does have programs, and thinking early on about this is a great thing to do. So fifth graders there at, at Rice, and even other students around the country, um, I will include in the follow-up link a link to uh, a place where NASA opens up internships, which are generally for high school age students and college age students. And so they have a particular site where you can actually apply to become an intern and getting an internship, whether it's at the NASA Johnson Space Center or any of the other NASA centers, is such a great way to get your foot in the door. So I'll send out that link um, so that teachers have that for a reference share that with their students, especially as they're thinking in the future. So it's certainly not easy, but taking good courses, being involved in a lot of activities at school, and having the interest, those types of things really help you uh, when you fill out applications to that. So that's a great question, and we'll certainly give you some more information, especially to the teachers, to share with their students. So here's another question that comes from Lincoln Avenue School, and they're wondering, is NASA planning on space mining anytime soon? That's an excellent question, and yes, we actually are. We're working with uh, two mining companies, um, Planetary Resources and Deep Space Industries. These are two mining companies that we are working with, and the plan is actually to uh, go to specific types of asteroids, 
not all asteroids have the same type of materials in them. Some are, uh, like I said, very rich in metal. Those are very different types of asteroids than the one 1999 JU3, which is thought to be water rich. And so the other types of cars is going after the water. So for mining, they're looking at the metal. They're also looking at mining the water. And again, water is very, very attractive because of the opportunity it gives us to harness the water from the asteroids that we can use as life support and we can use as rocket fuel. And we can use these asteroids as supply depots. One of the things I didn't get a chance to mention in the presentation was that the um, asteroids around Mars, the moons of Mars, Phobos and Deimos, those are thought to be water rich. So if we can figure out how to extract water, mine water, from asteroids, near Earth asteroids, we can apply that technology, all those lessons we learned, to the moons of Mars, Phobos and Deimos, and then we can help explore Mars surface. Because if we have water uh, stations in orbit from these asteroids around Mars, that helps us get to the surface of Mars much more easily and quickly. So it's a very good question. Yes, we are seriously looking at mining asteroids. Excellent. Uh, so Terp Toby Farms, uh, this is our group that we have with us from Pennsylvania, they're wondering, so you get all this data, what, what, what do these agencies do with the data collected? Are you like, look at it and you're done, or does it take a long time, or what do you do with the data collected after the mission? So what do we do with the data? Well, there's, there's two aspects of the data that we use, right? Um, there's the data that we get from the remote sensing from the spacecraft. So the spacecraft actually um, takes measurements from orbit. And you saw the uh, Hayabusa 2 spacecraft um, do some preliminary flybys around the asteroid, and they were looking for places to go, but they were also studying the type of composition, um, the type of rocks, the type of surface that the asteroid has. All of that is important information, and we study that to help us learn about these type of asteroids. Then we also have things like the mascot lander and other rovers, little hoppers that go down to the surface, and they will take um, data up close and personal, right from the They're in direct contact with the asteroid, and they collect a lot of information and beam that back to Hayabusa 2, which then beams it back to Earth. So we've got the remote sensing data from the spacecraft, and then the data from the little landers that are in contact with the surface, right? All that information is going to be analyzed. That will be uh, beamed back to Earth probably in the 2018, 2019 uh, timeframe, and we'll spend lots of time looking at that data uh, analyzing that data and writing papers and learning more and more about these asteroids. But the most important uh, data that we get doesn't come back to us until the asteroid sample return mission is over, and that's when Hayabusa 2 delivers its sample return capsule back to Earth, pieces of the asteroid inside that capsule. And then we take those pieces and we spend lots and lots of time analyzing those. And that can take a number of years, analyzing the pieces. We have lots of special equipment that we have to use to analyze those pieces, put it in special laboratories. But one of the m most interesting things is a lot of those pieces or a significant fraction of that sample that's returned, about 25% is kept pristine for later use. So you, you guys, boys and girls, who are thinking about becoming planetary scientists, maybe in 20 years from now, um, they may actually have samples ready for you to analyze from 1999 JU3 because we always keep a little bit left over for future generations to learn about these asteroids because we have better technology 20 years from now, or we will have better technology 20 years from now than we have now. So we'll be able to get out a lot more information. So the data from this mission lasts a very, very long time, and it's very, very exciting and very productive to be part of these missions. Yeah, and depending on the instruments on the probe, the, you can get imagery data, you can get spectral data. It all depends on the type of instruments that are being utilized. And it really, that data is almost, uh, it's more than you could even ask for in many cases, and it really does take a long time to work with that data. Uh, and what's interesting is the building where Paul and I are sitting here uh, at the Johnson Space Center in Houston, we will house some of those samples in our laboratories right in the building that we're sitting in. So maybe we'll have some of you people working with us in our curation facilities uh, curating that material as well. So that's pretty exciting too. 
We have another question from Lynn Haven and Miss Ackerlin's group. She's wondering, and they're wondering, does the robot probe pick up the targets before it leaves, or are things left on the surface of, uh, of these asteroids? So everything that the um, Hayabusa 2 spacecraft puts on the surface of the asteroid stays there. So those target markers stay there on the surface. Um, the mascot lander and some of the other little rovers um, that the Hayabusa 2 spacecraft deploys to the surface, drops to the surface, will actually stay on the asteroid. And some of the rovers will operate for a number of hours. I said the mascot um, rover will operate for about uh, 18 hours. But after that, um, the battery power runs out and it effectively can't relay any more information. So it stays on the surface. So yes, we actually leave uh, equipment behind, but it's served its purpose. It's got a lot of information, and all that information is relayed back to Earth via the, the Hayabusa 2 spacecraft. And that happens with other planetary missions mm -hmm. as well, because bringing these items back uh, would certainly be extremely expensive, and we can certainly get uh, as much data from them as we possibly can, which makes that very successful in what we can learn about these bodies. Right. So here's an option, actually also from Lynn Haven is, do you know how far away Hayabusa 2 is from the Earth right now? Hayabusa 2, I don't know the exact number, but um, you can go to, there's a, a JAXA website with uh, Hayabusa 2. Uh, maybe we can send the link out to, to everyone. Absolutely. And um, you can look and see where Hayabusa 2 is in terms of the distance uh, from the Earth. Uh, again, we, we launched last December, um, and the Hayabusa 2 spacecraft is actually on its way. One of the things it does do, though, is it's not too far away from Earth because it's doing a gravity assist. Right? So it's actually coming back towards Earth. It does a loop, comes back towards Earth. Uh, it'll rendezvous or come close to Earth this December and make a very close approach to Earth. And what that does is the gravitational interaction of the Earth with the spacecraft causes the spacecraft to be slingshotted out even faster. And so that helps the spacecraft get more energy, more velocity, more speed, so that it can rendezvous with 1999 JU-3. This is one of the techniques that we use to send spacecraft to other places. And we've done this not only with Hayabusa 2, we did this with um, uh, Hayabusa 1 and other spacecraft that we've sent out to rendezvous with other objects out in the solar system. It's a very neat technique. Um, so anyways, keep in mind that Hayabusa 2, in December of this year, will be coming very close to Earth and then heading out again towards 1999 JU-3. Excellent. So here's a question from Gates Intermediate School in Massachusetts, and they're wondering, could an asteroid be said to be an early example of what a terrestrial planet was like when it was first being formed? Very, that's a very good question. So some of the asteroids actually could be very similar to the types of composition that the early Earth had. So the Earth is undoubtedly made up of some type of asteroidal material, the Sun also and the rest of the planets. It's a question of figuring out what type of asteroid uh, actually formed, helped form the Earth. And there was many, it wasn't just one, there were many, many types of, of these early asteroids that formed and, and formed, uh, got together and formed the Earth. And so understanding what these asteroids are like, that's the whole point of this type of mission, is understanding what the type of materials of these type of asteroids are like helps us understand what the early Earth may have been like, what the components of the early Earth were like, and how the water, uh, water in our oceans and the water in our atmosphere may have been delivered to the early Earth, as well as organic. So it's a very good question. We don't know the exact type, but we can get some hints on what the um, type of, of um, early asteroids that formed the Earth were like. Excellent. And, you know, related to that, uh, one of the groups there in Lynn Haven are wondering, is it possible that asteroids could have been made from a different solar system or a different universe? Is, is that possible it's, at all? It's possible. I mean, we, we know there's lots and lots and lots of solar systems out there, and um, most of the solar systems we see, we think we actually see things like the Kuiper Belt and Oort Cloud. Uh, we have hints that they're there. Um, so it's not too surprising that you may find uh, other solar systems with comets and asteroids. Um, it's really much harder, though, to get um, comets and asteroids coming from another solar system. Comets, yes. Comets, actually, because they move so fast, you may be able to get 
um, a comet that is coming in from another solar system. But we haven't seen one yet. It would be very exciting to see one, um, but we haven't seen anything yet. But we do see evidence that other solar systems have um, small comets and asteroid material flying around them as well. Excellent. So here's a, a question about the mascot lander. Mm -hmm. And Lynn Haven is wondering, how come the mascot lander is like the size of a shoebox? Well, the, the size of the shoebox is it's, um, when you go into space and you only have so much mass, it's really hard to launch um, things into space because you have to get out of Earth's gravitational well, right? The Earth's gravity holds things like, so that's why you need those big rockets. And if you see the size of the rocket that needs to be launched in order to send the spacecraft to the asteroid, you'll notice that the, the, the rocket is very big and the spacecraft is very small. So the size of your instruments and the, the amount of mass is really key. So you want to be able to maximize your, in other words, have the most mass for your instrumentation for all your scientific equipment and at the same time be able to get to the asteroid. So it's sort of like a bit of a trade. You have to balance between can I get to the asteroid and then keep in mind too we have to come back. To get the Hayabusa spacecraft has to come back. So you have to do this balance of I have to get to the asteroid and then I have to come back to the asteroid and at the same time still have enough um, mass left over uh, to, in order to investigate what the asteroid is. So the mascot lander is only the size of a shoebox. It's about 10 kilograms, so it's a little over about 22 pounds. And it's the size of a shoebox. It has four instruments, four instruments in it. And those instruments are on the surface and it has a very well, um, small lifetime of about 16 hours or so. But again, it's the size of a shoebox based on the amount of mass that was available in order to deliver it to Hayabusa 2. If we had, um, maybe the asteroid was a lot closer, um, it didn't take as long to get there, then other mascot um, types for future missions, maybe the mascot 2 lander or mascot 3 or mascot 4, maybe those will be bigger, bigger types of instruments. Excellent. That mascot lander is actually pretty neat looking to think that it, it kind of hops around on the planet. Uh, during its at least lifetime. So excellent question there. Uh, Lynn, uh, Lynn Haven is also wondering um, how long do you think it will be until the Hayabusa 3 mission gets okay. launched? It, it's really interesting to see. Right now um, there are, are lots of plans. Um, we as scientists we always plan out the next mission even when the, the mission we're working on is flying. Um, so again Hayabusa 2 was thought about and started planning while Hayabusa 1 uh, was still ongoing. Keep in mind these missions take a long, long time. Hayabusa 1 went from 2003 to 2010. Hayabusa 2 will go from 2014 to 2000, uh, 2020. So uh, you can't just sort of wait for the spacecraft to come back the next mission and then start uh, planning for the Hayabusa 3. So actually people are starting to think about it now and start planning uh, Hayabusa 3 missions now. So maybe in another, uh, let's say, uh, three or four years, we'll have a more defined plan. But the next Hayabusa mission will launch after uh, Hayabusa 2 gets back. But we start thinking about and planning those missions and what type of asteroids we're going to go to and what instruments we're going to bring to the asteroid a long time before we actually launch the mission. Excellent. Uh, and looking to the future is something that is quite interesting and what will dictate, you know, the funds available and that type of thing and how uh, the new technology that can even come about. Uh, it's really interesting to think about the future of exploration. Now, I think for many of our groups, they are getting it since it's 15 or 17 minutes past the top of the hour. They're getting ready to move on to some of their next classes and probably getting prepared for even towards the end of the school year. So first of all, I want to thank all of you that are on the line for participating today and for your great input and your great questions. I also want to make sure to thank again uh, our speaker today, Paul Abel. I'm, I'm serious when I tell you we are very, very lucky to have had him with us today. He is a very busy individual, so thank you again, Paul, no for worries, all your time. 
Uh, and I, I see one or two other questions that, that are coming in, but again, for those of you that have indicated you're going to have to depart, thank you uh, very, very much for attending today, and we hope you have a great summer break whenever that does start. Uh, so, Paul, one additional question we had sure. come in. Actually, there were two, um, I believe, both from Lynn Haven. One was, how do the spacecraft follow these asteroids? Mm -hmm. If they're moving and the spacecraft's yeah. moving, how, how, how can they even follow and do what they have to do? Right. So one of the things that you do is we have, uh, remember I told you about the ground-based telescopes that, that find these asteroids? So you have what we know as an orbit. You know what the orbit of the asteroid is. The spacecraft has what we call um, tracking telescopes, onboard navigation cameras, and they use those to guide in on the asteroid. So they actually look for the asteroid, they pick up the asteroid, they're on a similar orbit trajectory as the asteroid. When they get close, um, then they start looking for the asteroid and they use those cameras to find the asteroid and then the computer guides in the uh, robotic spacecraft to the asteroid and for a rendezvous and then the mission starts from there. Awesome. Uh, that's some. I bet you need a lot of math skills to be able to do lots that. of lots of math and and really good uh, uh, imagery analysis, data processing, very key. So computers and math, very very important. Awesome. So here was another question from Lynn Haven, and they're wondering what would happen to the asteroid, or even to the planet, if it hit a planet like Jupiter. Mm. So if it hit a if uh, if 1999 Ju3 hit a planet like Jupiter, there would be a very big explosion. Uh, it would be like many, many uh, nuclear uh, bombs being exploded all at once. And uh, if you remember, you maybe can go on the internet and you can look up 1994, the year 1994, there was an event called Shoemaker-Levy 9, and it was a, a comet that actually hit Jupiter. It was a lot bigger than asteroid uh, 1999 Ju3. But it was uh, it created uh, a lot of explosions, and and that's what would happen if an asteroid uh, exploded or hit uh, Jupiter, because it would explode in the upper atmosphere of Jupiter, and we would actually uh, potentially, if it was on uh, the side facing us, we could actually see that explosion with our telescopes and maybe even the, the Hubble Space Telescope as well. But would we be affected by that explosion no, if no. it's so large? No, that, that explosion, even though it's very big, it would be so far away from us and in Jupiter, um, it wouldn't affect us uh, whatsoever. So um, when these asteroids hit other planets like Saturn and Jupiter, um, we may see the explosion, but it has no effect on, on Earth uh, or us at all. Excellent. And maybe I'll ask one last question for those groups that are on the line and see if anything else comes in. Um, any recommendations on thinking of the future? What should students, do they have to be, you know, like top-notch A students, study math, study science, or what, any recommendations on what they can do if they have an interest in a career path similar to yours? Right. So one of the things I will tell you, um, uh, boys and girls, is that um, you guys are the ones that uh, have the best opportunity for doing some of these things in the future. The future is looking very, very good, very exciting. Um, I think that some of you, if you wanted to, you could be asteroid scientists, you could be comet scientists, you could be astronauts, engineers, all the things that we do here at NASA Johnson Space Center. I wasn't the best student, but I worked very, very hard in, in what I do. And if uh, you study computers, if you study math, astronomy, science, biology, a lot of the science and engineering, physics, um, all those classes, um, geology, of course, because I'm a geologist, all those things help you uh, prepare yourself for this type of work. You don't have to be the best student, but if you try really hard and keep at it and applying it, um, then you'll go far and you can achieve your dreams. And I honestly think that um, in our lifetime, your lifetime, you will see these people, people actually go to the asteroids and maybe even onto Mars and other places in the solar system. So it's a very exciting time. So study hard and have a lot of fun. Awesome. 
Well, great advice there, Paul. And so with that, it's a little after 20 past the top of the hour, and um, we're going to bring this to a close. But again, thank you all so much for participating today. We really enjoyed your questions, your input, and all your insight and thoughts and curiosity. And again, thank you very much, Paul, for joining us today and sharing your knowledge and passion about what you do. My pleasure. Thank you for having me. All right, everyone, well, take care, and we'll look forward to connecting with you sometime in the future. And again, have a great summer break whenever that starts for you. We look forward to connecting with you in the future. Bye-bye for now. Bye-bye.